Gentles do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. So, how to start a puppet theater, or more likely a puppet troupe, in the 21st century? Now the first question is why, which I've already somewhat addressed, but because so few people have ever seen a puppet show, and that number dwindles much further, if you take my advice here. In 2005, I had taken the most serious puppet trip I had ever taken up until that point. I had seen a few puppet theaters in 1996 in Paris. I saw a not particularly good Guignol show. In 2000, I saw a kind of a youth puppet theater in Bucharest, Romania. I saw a marionette show at uh, the Hohenzollern pa uh, Palace in... Vienna, and then I got to Prague and I saw a few puppet shows there, including the classic Don Giovanni of, at the National Marionette Theater. But those got me interested, but they, they weren't the things that really pushed me to do it. And what really pushed me to do it, and I've gone into this at much further length, so I'm not going to go over it again, was my 2005 trip where I went to Paris, saw a Guignol show, went to Charleville, Mezières, saw student performances, and between those two, my brain was already completely blown. Uh, uh, gone were all the old ideas of what a puppet theater was, and in its place was something, well, that, that uh, I've covered in my European puppet history, or history of puppetry, and uh, my puppetry as antidote art lectures. But then I went to um, Berlin, where I saw the figure circle, uh, which was shadow puppets. Then I saw at Die Schaubude, uh, a show by Der Weite Theater, the, uh, the white theater, uh, doing a very, uh, kind of a parody of mysteries, but it was one of the funniest puppet shows I've ever seen. Um, and then I went to Poland, um, where I saw a show, uh, Balladina, which had absolutely incredibly made artistic puppets. And I had more discussions with people. I, I, one of the things I had decided in 2005 on this, the two month part of my trip for learning about puppetry was I decided to also make recordings and, and it was on a pretty bad recorder, so I can't share them much with anyone, but, but it was for me to learn. So I had something to go back and listen to. But then in the Czech Republic, I went to the Puppet Museum in Hrudim. I went to Hradac Kralova and at Drak Theater, where I met uh, Jakob Krofta. And then in, uh, the, uh, they also took me on the road which was just a most incredible experience just for surviving the van drive over to uh, Prague uh, to where they performed uh, the Magic Bagpipe. And then in Prague, I stayed and I saw uh, why well, I, I met uh, Nina Malikova over at Lodkash, the puppetry magazine. And I saw... Uh, most importantly, I saw some other puppet-related things, but most importantly, I saw for the first time Bukhtia Lotki, which kind of tra translates into buns or cakes and puppets. And what they were doing was just completely... I realized that when I saw them that anybody could make a puppet theater 
although it's not that simple, but that we could do it in Alaska. So then we went back in Alaska and we did it. And I will mention some of that here. But what I, I remember, the last place I went to was the Salzburg Marionette Theater. And I had such an incredible trip. And I had this vision, uh, looking back, you know, I, I said to myself, every small little town in America has a rock band or musical entity ensemble of some sort. Why don't they all have puppet theaters? They're easy to make. They're easy to start. Why don't they have that? Uh, there are so many rock bands and so few puppet theaters. I thought, why is, is that? And especially the more I thought about where we're going in the 21st century, the more I thought it, we have to have them because we need the physical, tangible reality of puppet theaters, which I've gone into in other places in my lectures. So, so then the question is how to go about getting interested in puppetry, starting a puppetry. Well, first of all, there are two different routes you can go if you if you get interested in doing this. Uh, um, getting you interested is not the subject of this particular discussion. That's a different thing. Well, you know, and at some point I'm going to talk about the best puppet films, uh, really interesting puppet theaters to visit in Europe. Uh, what little I know about America, I do know something about America, but America is so f spread apart, it's much harder to find good puppetry there. So, two possible avenues, either to go to school or not to go to school. So, you can go to school to learn about theater, puppetry, join a puppet troupe or, or a puppet theater through that avenue. The advantages are you do get theater, partic uh, theater training, and that is important uh, to have theater training. You also get, at least I hope you get, and this is where I start to have my doubts, a good piece of history. To me, puppet, uh, puppet theater, puppetry, has to have its history connected to it. It can't be a thing. You just can't say, I'm going to make... Uh, forks and knives into puppets without any further uh, looking into history of what puppetry is. I mean, you can't actually make puppetry out of forks and knives. Don't get me wrong. That's a, a fantastic thing to do if you know what you're doing. Um, but from my observation, uh, puppet history isn't that strong a field uh, for academic study. I think there are some places, maybe the University of Connecticut um, and whatnot. You can also get puppet theory, which is different, because then you start asking yourself questions like, what is a puppet? You know, what are we doing when we're breathing life into this inanimate object? Uh, does it relate to the religious as it did in the past? Uh, these kinds of questions. The other thing is you get practice in, I think, the main uh, advantage of going to school is that you get practice in the training. So you learn about the theater, but you also learn about, and the theater isn't simply uh, the rehearsals and such, but you learn what makes a theater work, the lighting, the curtains, uh, the different styles of the theatrical stages and such. But, uh, but more importantly, you get to rehearse and practice technique. So when I went to the puppetry school, Esnam, uh, l'école supérieure nationale de la marionnette, um, which should really be Ensam, but there's another place called Ensam uh, in uh, Paris, so they decided not to call it that, another national school. But, but no, you get, um, uh, like there, they would do repetitions, as they would call it, but repetitions mean practice. Uh, over and over are puppet techniques. So you wouldn't just hold up a puppet as a glove puppet and make it work. You have to get your, develop your muscles there because you're going to be holding your hands up quite a long time. It's a real uh, physical uh, training uh, that you can get in some, I, and I, I do recommend uh, getting into the International Puppetry School in Charleville, Mezier, if at all possible. They usually have, I think they're on a rotating schedule now where they have one group of 15 students for a couple of years. 
uh, and in between uh, for three years and in between on the the second year they start another group or something like that so they have different groups but and and the main thing there is to have some sort of facil- facility with puppetry to have uh, to speak French at least on a, a have the ability to communicate, which is what's going to keep most Americans away. And in a way, that's good because Americans tend to dominate whenever they can any sort of field. Um, but, and this is very important, the going to school gets you the exposure to well-known puppeteers. And that's perhaps the best thing is, is getting a, a chance to actually meet puppeteers. Now, there are disadvantages to going to school to learn about puppetry. One is um, you'll do student performances, but it'll be years before you're actually performing for paying customers, before you're actually making it work. Also, there are what I would call the limitations of national styles. When I was traveling, particularly in 2005, I saw this, but I've, I've seen it at other times, and I see it, I'm living here in Tbilisi, Georgia. There is a certain style they have here. Um, but and all most of the students who are working here are pup, are are people who went through the Georgian theatrical tradition, which also means they're not exposed to and the national uh, styles means you're not exposed to what someone is doing just over the border in another country. So, for instance, um, in France. Everyone took puppetry very seriously, as it should be. And they were experimenting in what I would call the modernist mode when they were experimenting. Uh, a modernist, I, I would say more modernist than postmodernist uh, because of, of the way they were doing it. But nevertheless, um, very interesting work. And there was also the traditions of Guignol and such like that. So those are your French styles. But none of these people knew anything about the Czech styles. And the Czech styles are wildly bizarre. So I brought a French friend, my friend Paulette, to come with me, to meet me up to uh, Prague one year. Uh, I think it was like 2016 or 2017. Uh, And I think it was 2016. And she was just like, whoa, what's going on here? Because it violated all the rules she had learned. But it also, of course, gives you ideas. You, You know, the Czechs, are much more, they have a very strong theatrical tradition, particularly with puppetry. But they uh, don't have uh, the same, there's a certain kind of uh, black humor that the Czechs are noted for. And so they don't take things in the same sort of serious way that the French do. And so, um, I mean, we were at a puppetry show for children. And there are children in the audience between, I don't know, we'll, we'll just say 10 years old. It may have been younger, 10 years old and 16 years old or 17. And they did a puppetry show where this man came out and he was, um, what can we say? He, w- he was sitting at a, bar, a table in a, a pub uh, and a hospita, as they would call it, and and he was sitting there with a, he was kind of like drunk on the table with a beer. He wakes up, there's a cleaning woman cleaning up the beer, the, the beer stains on the floor. And uh, there's another, there's a, a bartender cleaning off the glasses and such. He gets up, he starts wobbling around. Before you know it, he gets thrown a beer, a new beer. Some of it spills, the woman's cleaning it up. He drinks some and then he falls back to sleep. This happens three times without much change before on the third time, suddenly this guy goes into some sort of alcoholic stupor. A little devil shows up a little about, yeah, I don't know, not very tall, just a little guy shows up at the end of the bar. And basically what's happened, what happens after a while is they, the, the, the devil, there's a group of devils. They're pulling out, uh, His intestines, (laughs) which are red cloth and such. And I'm looking at my friend Paulette, who is just 
never seen anything like this. But then I said, you know, not only would this not be a show for children in America, this wouldn't be a show for adults in America because most Americans think of puppets and puppetry only as if you're going to do something experimental, it's often going to be Muppets, but just naughty, nasty Muppets. Um, and I think that, that seeing another style, now, when I, in 2005, when I was traveling, what I saw was that, oh, um, you know, you, you have all of, uh, these different styles and I'm taking them all in. So what am I, thoughts when I went back to Alaska was just to put the whole thing into a uh, blender, a Cuisinart, and turn it on high and see what we came out with, with all this, all these different techniques together. I think the other, one of the other problems with theatrical training is you often tend to get the modernist or postmodernist assumptions of that era. And today it's like critical theory, whatever. Um, and the worst of all aspect is if you happen to pick up the politics and propaganda of the era because the students all want to make messages of, that are f focused in a certain way and they don't understand the idea that art isn't supposed to be propaganda. Now you can make puppet shows to as they did in uh, outside of Sarajevo in Bosnia uh, of you know that teach the children not to pick up not to go to certain places where there's unexploded ordnance uh, because it's dangerous. You can do that kind of thing. And that is a very low level kind of instructor instruction propaganda. But I'm talking about the major propagandas of our times. And I think the idea of using puppetry simply as a mean for, means for propaganda is, it's just, we need pu puppetry as an art first. And I know there will be people who will say, but all art is po political. Fine, you can think that, but I'm still saying there is a big difference between the people trying to push a message down your throat and someone who's, whose message is just latent within the work as part of who they are. So you can go to school, there are advantages and there are disadvantages. Or you can not go to school. Develop a hunger for the art and history of puppetry by yourself. Explore the physical reality of puppetry. Start to make something, anything, and see what happens. You're not bound by the rules. You're not bound by people who say you have to do things a certain way. It also means it's very easy to be sloppy, but we'll come to that in a moment. But you can start in an amateur, primitive manner. And especially if you're around people who have no idea what you're doing, which is, I know in America, that's almost everybody, uh, you can see what happens. Also, people are now so conditioned by postmodernist assumptions about art that what you take to be a beginning primitive amateur move will be seen by other people as being something you did on purpose. Uh, that's up to you if you want to play that game. I, I uh, remember talking, who was it, to the people who did uh, Leibach, uh, the Neue Slowenische Kunst, and they had an art show in New York in the... Uh, about 1990 and I remember talking to one of the Slovenian artists and he said people think we're doing postmodernism but we're not but it looks that way and I think that's a very interesting uh, philosophy but anyway the thing about not going to school is you can really explore and if you're not worried about making money to begin with you can just go ahead and start with an individual show a couple of people you can just choose things. You can also choose physical objects and props better. You, but first of all, you need to have some sort of idea of just how far you can go with it, which is why watching a video like this is a good place to begin. Some of the advantages are you get thrown into the deep end quickly, or you can keep it simple. It's up to you. So you can start making money as soon as you open the door. Now, it's different in different countries. Here in Georgia, what's really strange is people just do things on the street and collect money and no one cares at all. There no, doesn't seem to be any legislation about that. But if you open a little theater, suddenly the government gets really interested in you. So if I was doing it here, I would do it in public places to start where I don't have to worry. In Alaska, it never mattered what I did. 
I could just simply start performing, charge a few dollars, and collect a bit of money, pass it out among the people. And it wasn't so much a non-profit organization as it was a no-profit organization. But we learned many things. Um, you can keep it on the level of a folktale, or you can develop it into something no one has ever seen before. And I highly suggest looking at puppetry's history with folktales, fairy tales, mythology, the classic stories of puppetry, and understanding those. Uh, I think everyone needs to do that. But there's a good chance that if you're just kind of working on your own uh, to try to develop something, you, will, you might create something no one else has ever seen before. So you can start intuitively, but you can also dive deeply into research. And what, from what I've understood from uh, the puppet uh, institutions, uh, the, the schools that are training is, you, you only get a cursory view of the history. And then again, it tends to be the history related most to where you live and not the broader sphere. Um, one nice thing I did appreciate about uh, the International Puppetry Institute and the school, the, the, uh, the Ecole Nationale Superior de la Mariana, uh, the Arts of Marionette, whatever, uh, is that they brought in Sicilian marionettes. They brought in people from other places. So you were exposed to puppeteers. That would be a great education if you already had your ideas, uh, if you had some sort of solidity coming in. So you don't just simply follow what other people are doing. Um, but since few people have ever seen what you're trying to do, you have plenty of room to create your own style or create a small group style. And it is in creating things that are neat unique, which is where the power of puppetry comes in. So I think there's a great deal to knowing the roots and, and building upon them, but I also think there's a great deal in creating new styles, but new styles that are based on research, not simply coming up with something in the middle of the night, we're just going to only use nails, but, but at the same time, you can kind of feed those artistic obsessions. The disadvantage and this is important. There is a temptation just to improvise funny sketches. This is one of the worst temptations for puppetry, is to simply improvise funny sketches. Now, this is good if the point of your puppetry is to make funny sketches, but most people don't have that kind of inventive uh, comic backbone to do it. So one group who's not a puppeteer... Uh, puppetry group, uh, Irish uh, trio, Foil, Arms, and Hog, I am sure if they did puppetry, they would come up with unique things that no one has ever seen before, and they would be completely funny. There's no problem with, with uh, humor and puppetry. But we need more than that, and there are people who have more skills than just that. So... Uh, without a connection to the roots of puppetry, you might just reinvent the wheel over and over again in silly ways. And you might also discover you have no talent for it. So simply, I think there's a certain kind of an, uh, mindset that has to go with puppetry. And one is you have to be interested in, in the things, the, the little the, they're not always little, but uh, the, the material objects that you're using, or even if you're making shadows, the way they look, the light looks, the way it feels. I notice here among my friends who make uh, hand shadow puppets at Budragana Gagra, they make both animal hand shadows, uh, which is traditional, and they make abstract hand shadows. And what's interesting about that is that they are really disciplined. They have to repeat these things over and over and over again. And the reason for that is your hand doesn't remember the way your brain does. So you have to keep working it to get it to keep doing the same things. So you can learn then about theater and puppetry on your own, or you can just simply join a puppet troupe, or you can do what I did in Alaska, just simply start doing it. And what I did is in Alaska is I started doing it. And then uh, no one else in Alaska knew absolutely anything 
about puppetry. And it was all up to me to teach them. So I had to look for videos. And at that time, 2005, 2006, when I started this, there, there were precious few interesting videos on YouTube compared to now. Uh, it really took me a lot of work to find material to show people. Um, but I found enough to, tr to teach people to a certain degree. We were lacking in the training. We were lacking in some of the seriousness that comes with the actual training. And, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's a completely valid way. And there have been other puppeteers, and I've met some of them here. Uh, just talked to a friend, Maya, who's a Georgian. And I just did an interview with her here. And she started off all by herself. Uh, and then joined up with troops. She didn't actually go to a school to learn puppetry. Um, and so that, to me, is a perfectly valid way of going about it. Some of the, dis uh, the advantages of doing it that way is you're, you're going to be self-training. You're going to be self-motivated, which is good if you are self-motivated. Some people need a teacher or need uh, the discipline of a school to learn that sort of thing. So while you're thinking about that, here are a few of my rec uh, recommendations. If you already know that you want to attempt something, and these are things I think are things to keep in mind that why puppets, why, why try to start a puppet theater? So I'm assuming if you clicked on this video, you already were saying to yourself something like, hey, that might be interesting to do. So much of what I just said, you can take, you, you are, might already have your solution to that problem of go to school or not to go to school. But here is what I want to emphasize. Puppets have a material reality, first and foremost. That's the most important thing. Puppets have a material reality. So, can you make uh, digital puppets? I suppose, but remember, there's no physical reality there. Is a, a puppet in a movie a material reality? Well, if you look at the Jan Schrankmeyer, the Quay brothers, absolutely. I mean, it's the Quays and Schrankmeyer who are playing with the physical material. And they're doing it so well that when we watch it, it inspires us to go touch physical objects. The emphasis should be on the physical material reality. So even when making films, it should be on the objects and the textures. It should be as real as possible. So for instance, when my friends are making the hand shadow puppets, it's about real hands. That is to say, because you could obviously make a digital recreation of that, but it isn't the same thing. And it has to be, and the thing about them is it's real time. Everything should be as real as possible and in real time. In other words, don't give in to the temptation to turn puppet shows into yet one more multimedia theater presentation based around the screen. And um, when I was talking to the late great uh, puppet historian Henrik Yurkowski, he said to me, he said, there is a new style of theater. And it is puppetry sometimes is a part of it, other forms of theatrical presentation, but it's essentially some kind of multimedia theater. And he says it shouldn't be called puppetry. And I understood very deeply what he meant by that, that the puppet has to be the thing. There has to be a material reality somewhere in the presentation, and it should be in real time somewhere as well. Uh, unless it's an animated film, but then we should feel the textures, which are very important. So one thing I do notice, there is one, I, I really like watching Georgian puppetry. One weakness in their puppetry is they tend to do it all to pre-recorded soundtracks. And this is, this comes from the, uh, the weakness of national styles that I mentioned before. They haven't seen other people doing this before. So if you, when I saw Bukti Alotki play in Prague, they didn't use anything as a background, except now and then they, there might be a recording of a sound or something like that that they couldn't get. But it was just very sporadic. 
All their words, they were speaking them. All the sound effects, mostly they were making them. And most importantly, they were making the music live. And that's important. So there was sometimes drumming, sometimes uh, uh, accordion playing. Those things to me are so important. They would sometimes use background sound. But it's the to me, that's very important. So that isn't to say I haven't had wonderful experiences in the Georgian puppet theaters I have. And in fact, one of my deeper puppet experiences happened around a Gabriad's theater uh, piece of Ramona, which is all done to pre-recorded uh, sound. So secondly, it's most important to spend some time thinking about what kinds of materials you're going to use. And this is where puppetry, I think, radically differs from theater. Puppetry is about objects and materials. So traditionally, wood, various fabrics, canvas, curtains, papier-mâché, paper, cardboard, string, wire, rods, even the human body, especially fingers, these are all traditional things that have been used in puppetry. And the quality of these things is important too. But one thing that's happened since the end of the uh, last part of the 20th century, the list of materials has grown exponentially, limited by only by your imagination. So that now, things I have seen in puppet shows, rocks, bones, tree branches, freshly cut from the forest. Uh, in one case in Alaska, where the puppet was literally still dripping from having been hewn from a small log. Uh, the use of plastic toys and models, old dolls. Uh, Bukti Alotki used an electric train set at one point in their version of Hound of the Baskervilles, the Sherlock Holmes story. At one point, you know, Sherlock says to Watson or, or, you know, we should take the train. And a little electric train comes out from under the stage. It's just, that was the thing I think that completely said, oh, this is it. You can do all sorts of things. But old dolls, models, broken puppets, antique marionettes, mannequins. And don't forget, all the old Punch and Judy shows also featured a small dog named Toby. And don't forget, you can turn people into puppets, too. And so, really, what's happened is that the grammar of material for puppetry has expanded exponentially so that anything you can kind of see as a material object could be used, theoretically, in some sort of puppet show. Third, what kind of stage do you need? Now, while... Some puppets can be the size of a house. Generally, puppets are small. So it should be the stage, a stage of some sort. But there are two things to consider. What size stage should it, your stage be, and how many people will be watching the show? Okay, let's deal with the size issue first. You need to ask yourself, what is the size of the puppets you're using? Um, now, I've seen, of course, puppet shows where they use a... a a, a regular proscenium arch theater stage on a stage which would obviously be fit for humans. That's always a possibility. But one of the things that makes puppetry special is that you can put it in a little theater and push it all the way to the back of a room and puppets work so well in contained spaces. And, and that kind of puppet works does not work at all very well in a large open space. So that's one thing to consider. Um, so you need to figure out what the size of your puppets are, what kind of puppets they are. And you need to consider that generally in special moments, the size can be ranged from the height of a human being to the size of a hand or even smaller. I have a friend who's among the Russian exiles who lives here, and she's started a theater company called Teatrino. And it's, it's about the size of, of a toy theater, a to, uh, and it's small. Now, traditionally, toy theaters involve something that's a bit like 
uh, paper doll cutouts, but on some kind of, of board, small uh, cardboard or something. And they can be pushed in and out. Whereas she's actually using three-dimensional little puppets. And uh, she wanted to create something, so she started making these little black boxes. But they could also be larger puppets. A marionette theater, for instance, one that actually is a traditional marionette theater with carved wood uh, or, or some other material, something that has movements, particularly the more strings it has, is going to use need much more room for the strings and wires from above. Because in many cases, it works much more smoothly that you have a higher a little balcony above it to work from and that so that you're invisible. Now, some people might say, but I don't want to be invisible. You don't have to be invisible. I'm just saying, each kind of puppetry needs a, a certain kind of a, a space. So shadow puppets need space to be perform behind the screen as well as a certain kind of a lighting. Sometimes the stage can be more like an art installation. What I did in Alaska was I thought when I came back from this 2005 trip and having seen all these pieces, particularly Buktia Lutki was the one that really tipped me over the edge saying, we have to do this in Alaska because they were using such strange parts as like rusty pieces of iron found like, I don't know, in some industrial space. Uh, they were using... Uh, uh, ripped curtains of just any sort of fabric and all of this just naturally appealed to me. So when I came back to Alaska, they were also, one of the things they did about the stage was this is absolutely unique and fascinating. And they only did it for a couple of shows. I, I'm going to show you some photos here that will help to explain this, but let me explain this. So there was an embankment of little stages and, and fabrics then on top, there was a very small little stage. And then below it was a slightly larger, uh, a much, well, I wouldn't say very large, but a larger stage, uh, the size you would expect for a puppet show with marionettes and such. And then underneath it was a slightly smaller uh, stage with a curtain on it that would open sometimes. Now, the first little stage actually didn't do much. All it had was a little room with a bed in it. And at the beginning of the show, this little puppet man comes out, drinks from a some sort of alcohol, falls asleep on the bed, and the rest of his uh, the rest of the the piece was his dream, which then happens in the next stage. But in a kind of a cinematic uh, view, the, the stage on the bottom was actually used for inserts. So if somebody hands someone a gun, you'd see a human person hand someone a gun below, like a, it was like a, a close up in editing and film. And there were other things that happened, shadows that appeared on the sides of the screen, sometimes by accident. I think they started to realize that and started to work with it. Uh, they, and there were more spaces. They could come out in front of the stage. It was a completely live environment. So um, the stage could be like an art installation. Well, I saw those things and said to myself in Alaska, okay, we don't have the kind of people who are trained, nor do we have a theater space. But I thought, and, and I said, I can't do the kinds of more philosophical marionette performances I saw in Europe. What do I do? I said, okay, I've got Americans, I've got Alaskans who are very busy in the summer, so, which is why I couldn't get them together. And we're not going to use the really big theater stage that the town had. So we're going to go to the, the local state fair. We're gonna, we went into a uh, tent. Later, we went into an old log cabin. And then I had placed inside of this different people's, uh, I told them, create a box, make a little show for it. And then we had one person who was a master of ceremonies, the MC, who would come around and say, ladies and gentlemen, and I called it the Lilliputian puppet sideshow. And sideshow is the important word here. It's where the little acts that aren't in the main circus are, and you can go in and watch them. And that's what this was. 
So you walked into it, uh, eventually we got it. So you walked into the middle of the uh, the log cabin, and all around you were different boxes. So you had to move around and to see them. It was uh, the audience had to be very active in moving to watch because we would purposely do one on one side of the room, one on the other side of the room, rather than say simply going around or something like that. But I found that really fascinating. And I was actually inspired uh, to do that by certain performances I saw in Charlottesville, Mazier, by the, stu- the theatrical students there, the puppetry students, where you went and saw the puppets. You didn't simply sit and wait for them to come to you. Uh, there are other stages that need to be changed and moved quickly. There are so many styles. It really depends on your needs. But one thing I would encourage you to lean against is dull, empty stages. What I mean is there's a kind of a theater style black box and it has nothing in the set. Now, this isn't to say that every performance in a black box is bad or anything like that. But what I really want to encourage you, what I really think puppets are good at is texture. And texture is a much needed factor in today's world, just for life. We're being given terrible architecture, devoid of so much meaningful texture. We're not getting the the grain of wood anymore. We're not getting the grain of stone anymore. We're not getting, uh, what we're getting instead is glass, steel, kind of a dull cement. We're not getting things that are, are I, I look at texture as being like nutrition. And I have a lecture on that. Uh, and, and you should go over and look at that because that's really important to all of this. But let's go on. Fourth, how big should your performance space be? And this relates to what I just said. Uh, but let's think about size more carefully. Having a stage at a 2,000 seat theater is not good news. I actually had to do a performance in, um, what is it, Minneapolis, not Minneapolis, Rochester, uh, Minnesota. And they took us into the gymnasium of a high school. You can't think of a worse place to do a puppet show. But I was already prepared for it. I brought this uh, two very long uh, patchwork screens that we made out of all these different fabrics and we enclosed our show in it which then took over the environment for us so but we're going to talk more about texture in a moment at professional puppet theaters i have visited i would say a lot depends on the size of the puppets and for most puppets ranging from about one-third human size to the smaller marionettes a room holding 75 to 150 people is the best situation. Um, And I talked to you about how I made curtains for this high school gymnasium, and that was to bring the size of the room down. Again, outdoors, not necessarily a good place for puppets. And when you get a bread and puppet theater in Vermont, they have to use giant parade-sized puppets to do their, their big shows in the field. And... I've always been a little suspicious of very large puppets, although I really like the Royal Deluxe out of Nantes and Paris, and they do spectacle puppets is what they do. Uh, they're huge. They're like several stories tall. They're, uh, they come down the street. It becomes a huge, their shows are like a huge celebration. But I think most puppetry is not going to go that direction. And you need to, to see that your puppets... Uh, can be seen by everyone in the room. I would say 50 people watching a puppet show is probably ideal. Uh, Even smaller is better, which I know, how are you going to make money on this? Well, we're not talking about an art in which the main point is to make money. We're talking about an art in which the main point is to communicate. What we did to make money at our show in Alaska is do the same show five times in a day, over and over and over and over and run it through. And uh, we, we did all right. Uh, there's other ways. We're not talking about the economics right now. But there are ways to make money. But, you know, uh, for one thing, if you have a really good show, you can charge better prices. So, 
but smaller is better. So smaller puppets, like the toy theater show that I was talking about, then you have new considerations. So, um, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, my friend Paulina has these small black stages that she wants to actually market and sell to many people as gifts for their children, which I wholly support. But for that kind of a, a crowd, you need a, a, a very small stage. And this is more something that's going to have to remain uh, theatrical because there isn't enough, uh, you can't get enough people to watch it. But again, I suppose you can, to use the awful YouTube word, you can monetize uh, your puppet shows online. But here's the thing. Puppet shows seen online are not puppet shows. <laughs> and I think anybody realizes that. I've got on my channel uh, lots of puppet shows. And uh, they just don't communicate the way they do in person. And you need to be there. And that's the importance of them. Forget about always thinking in terms of theatrical space as well. A puppet show can be like a museum tour. I had an idea for interpreting the movie Stalker outside and you're following a little puppet of the stalker leading the, the group, and he throws the little nut with a piece of, of ripped piece of fabric attached to it, and you follow it. Now, you would have to set up things to happen, but that's a possibility. Or you can it can take place in the round. And as I talked to you before, uh, you can have uh, the puppet show surround you, which I think is a really fascinating idea. Um you can have also a micro show, which is a bit what the toy theater is, or what used to be called a peep show, not to be confused with the porn world and its peep shows, which I, I don't think really exist anymore because now everything happens online, unfortunately. <clears throat> but if but the question about micro shows is if the show is only showing for a, a few people at a time, uh, if you get too many people there, how will they all be able to watch the show? And how long will they watch before the next group has to come and take their place? I mean, you can do this as like almost a, um, I want to say a theme park ride. Or where, you know, if you've gone to the theme parks where they have, I don't know, something like It's a Small World in Disneyland or something like that. And the boats keep coming around and the one piece just keeps happening over and over. Or like the haunted house idea. But... Um, those are all things that need to be thought about, but nevertheless, the size of the theater space the, or the performance space or what kind of performance space you're using is absolutely crucial. So let's talk about texture. One of the biggest problems that many modern theaters have is with the texture of everything. I've already mentioned the black box theater, which is at least dark and dark is better than white. Um, but there is a sterility to the aesthetics of the modern world uh, that I think is a real problem. But this also happens with the puppets as well. I think there's a problem with soft, plush, cute, muppetoid puppets. Um, so even when they're, like I said, even when they're kind of like adult-like, they're still for children. Just big adult children who know the meaning of uh, nasty words. So like Avenue Q or Peter Jackson's movie, Meet the Feebles. But that's not a way to get away from the sterile sets. Uh, and I think there, there's a problem with the overuse of soft, soft plush, kind of synthetic fabric, uh, Muppetoid type uh, puppets. Uh, that's my thing. You may not find that a problem, but I do. So... Also, watch out for the things you buy from companies designed to make a puppet show for you. There are these little companies that will sell you a puppetry kit, and it's almost always terrible from a textural artistic design point of view. It's usually too cute, but even when it's not, it's usually too too good. I think puppets need to have some rough edges around them, uh, uh, something that is, again, it's about texture. Now, I have books where you follow the instructions um, to design your puppet theater. So you're going to build a castellet or you're going to build some other kind of a marionette stage. 
And you look at it and you just go like, oh, this is just all too neat. And you need to do something to make it unique. So where was I recently that I saw some sort of puppet theater that had just the right sort of design? I've seen so many photos of them, but I'm trying to think of, oh, it was here at the Tbilisi State Puppet Theater. They let someone do the artwork in the halls. And I, I looked at that. I said, now that's what a puppet theater has to have is this kind of odd, quirky art. Uh, not too cute or anything like that, but stuff that makes you just think about texture or just brings you, you don't even necessarily think of it, but it's just bringing you into the space. Curtains do this almost involuntarily. A good, nice, red, rich velvet curtain is incredible for creating a mood. Um, whereas a white wall is not. It's just to put you two uh, different types of texture. The, the, the fabric of cloth is incredible for suggesting so many things to our minds. But the white flat wall, the white flat screen, they're killers of ideas. Likewise, if you're performing in a... If someone said, Burn, we'd like you to perform in this building. And I go over there and it's a uh, new building... I, this happened to me once uh, where I had to give a lecture there. And even giving the lecture there, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, new building, lots of glass, lots of hard corners and angles, uh, lots of white walls. And I just, eh, that, 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 there's something about that that kills the mystery that you need for puppetry. Puppetry goes along with the, the riot of textures we find in nature, the riot of textures we find in art. So, and for me, puppets and puppet theaters need a sense of real texture and real mystery. In dealing with the material reality of objects on the stage, we want puppets to be an antidote to the dead, lifeless simulacra online. We want people to walk out of the theater with rough burlap textures on their mind. We want them to go home and think about new uses for old bottles or broken theaters. We want, uh, which reminds me, puppetry and recycling go together very well. Uh, to, to find old objects and turn them into a puppet is an excellent occupation. Everything should be humming with textures. Rough wood, fish skeletons, old fur coats, driftwood shaped like dragons, delicate glass perfume bottled robots. But be careful. Don't forget to experiment with different mediums. So, water, oil, mud, f even fire under certain conditions. Even a wind source can create memorable moments. You can also use the theater space itself. A puppet on a wire can fly over the audience. Or you could just... Uh, set up a full-size mannequin off to the side to watch the whole show. Or you can turn off all the lights. Or you can even perform outside. Don't think standard theatrical performance. Why? Because standard theatrical performance screams a kind of audience predictability. And we want to blur the distinction between the stage and the audience at times. We want to surprise them. Because what's the point of trying to communicate without surprises? And this is what happens where relationships go bad in our daily life, is that one person knows what the other person is going to say, and it's so predictable because they've all had too many experiences together and not enough separately to bring new ideas to the table. Well, it's like that in life. Right now, music is very predictable. So... I mean, if I go to a show, you just know what kind of show it's going to be before you go. You go and you go like, okay, that was good. Or you walk out going, oh, well, whatever, and you forget about it. Well, you don't want people to forget about your puppet show. You want them to remember it. So you have to do use elements which are surprising even to you. So you use your imagination, but it also means the audience uses their imagination as well. Sixth. Lights. And this is a crucial element. Unless you're doing an outdoor show on a sunny day, 
And this is also where you can lose the whole show. Personally, I prefer completely unprofessional lighting. Uh, light bulbs hidden in little animal cages. Uh, naked filament light bulbs hanging in plain sight. And if the show is outside at night, why not do what the Indonesians do and use fire torches? For their, uh, they do that for their Wayan Kulit, the, the shadow puppets. There comes a point at which the lighting can be too professional, too clever, too slick. And the point is not to impress people with how much money you spent on your lighting. The point is to get across what you, that, again, it's about surprise. It's about communicating in ways people go like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. It's, a, it's about making them look at the objects in their world around them. I mean, do you want to change the way we use things in the world? Well, first you have to get people to focus on what we have around us. And the way to do that in a puppet show is with lighting. So certainly use professional lighting, but do it with care. Do it with imagination. Hide things. Don't show everything. Make things mysterious. And then we come to sound. <laughs> Everything I said about light goes double for sound. And if it's a small space, how much sound do you need? Volume is a serious problem. Um, if you're mic'd, it should fit the room. I once played at a rock club in New York City without any amplification, which violates all the rules of a rock club. But you know what? People paid attention to the show because they didn't know what we were doing. It was just so strange to them that we were doing something that obviously had sound, but we weren't requiring a sound system to get it across. If everyone in a room can hear a normal human voice, cause them all to be quieter by listening. Take control of the space. Don't be lazy. pre-recorded sound earlier. The first Guignol show I saw in 1996 in Paris was done to a pre-recorded message, a pre-recorded uh, uh, soundtrack. And so the Guignol just went up there and, and they mimed the, the people doing it. And, and quite frankly, I can't remember anything about that show. The second show I saw was in 2005 in Paris. My friend Pascal Prévost, and it was the uh, uh, Les Petits Bouffons de Paris. And I literally remember everything about that first show. And later he said, uh, I've seen that show a couple of times. And he said to me, I'm going to show you the first show you saw. And I remembered it. And, and I got more uh, footage of it on the second time because I knew what was coming. And I noticed that certain things had changed. I said, you've changed certain things. He goes, yes, we, we always do it differently. And so that was important. So I can't explain to you exactly why, but there's a difference between listening to a recording of a human voice or music or sound and listening to to an actual human voice, an actual instrument playing acoustically in a room. So that is a super crucial concept. Now, you can do whatever you want, but what I've learned is the more real you make it, the more the sound reflects that, the better. And pre-recorded sound is a crutch. Uh, people do it because they want to be able to move the puppets. But the truth is, I think puppets don't really need it that much. Now, there are some 
puppet shows that I've I've seen. For instance, um, I think you have to have pre-recorded sound and music at most shadow puppet shows, particularly, um, or if you're doing something like the Salzburg Marionette Theater does, which is to say they do um, operas. Well, they, unless, I mean, I wouldn't mind if someone just came there with a piano and played, but that's me. I think you need the pre-recorded sound uh, to do the opera with the puppets. And so you're now miming with the puppets. But I don't think I would have been so addicted to puppetry as an art if I hadn't heard the live music. <laughs> Bukhtiyalotki made me totally concentrated on the performance because they were playing, they were talking directly and they were playing their instruments live. Everything, you see, it's all, uh, everything becomes uh, more risky then. It's dangerous because there's more that can go wrong. And when, for instance, I went with the puppet troupe Dirac on their uh, show from Raditz Kralova to uh, Prague, they did it, this piece live, but it featured a live Moravian bagpipe. A live Moravian bagpipe. And this was absolutely, it's just like, oh, well, Naturally, all, all performances should have live bagpipes. Um, so I think, for instance, um, I've seen some absolutely cacophonous, wild live performances of the Sicilian marionettes. Well, before I saw the Sicilian marionettes, I've seen the Tone Marionette Theater, which is a similar style in Brussels. And there... Now they use the microphone. Uh, they have a, they get a pretty good audience. Their puppets are about one third size, which can be seen in uh, not a really big room, but a big enough room to get uh, maybe 150 people in the room. Um, but my friend Nicolas Jeal does all of the voices, and then the puppeteers do the movements. But he does the voices live, and he does every accent. It's just like, just crazy to hear. But one step above that is the cacophonous performances of the Sicilian marionettes, which are forever trapped in my ears. Um, I saw the, the show of Enzo Mancuso, uh, uh, and these shows are just so loud. And they have also are accompanied by a kind of a hand crank uh, sort of, uh, I want to say a spinet or or harpsichord or something that plays. It, it, it sounds a bit, uh, but it has a fairground sound, but it's a live instrument. I think they put some sort of cards in it that play certain tunes. But but then he's sitting there stamping his feet and the swords of the, the, the marionettes fighting each other are genuinely knocking against each other. And... His voice is so loud. I've never seen a louder performance or a crazier one. And these things get trapped in your mind because they are so, uh, they're, they just impress you because they're live. You can't beat live. And but like I say, pre-recorded music is, is, works well for shadow puppets and marionette theater uh, versions of ballets. But I think... I, and I've seen this here. Every puppeteer I've seen here in Georgia, including the Russian ones, all are kind of rely on pre-recorded music and sounds. And and yet it can work, as in the case of uh, Reza Gabriadza, actually brought tears to my eye. So, so yeah, I'm not saying never use pre-recorded sound, but I'm saying it's even stronger when you don't. And it, it all gets edgier, riskier. And as we move into the 20th century, the most important elements we need from puppetry are the live elements. Because if you want to make a puppet theater with screens working behind you and pre-recorded music and, and 
you know, uh, lights on a, on a digital uh, motherboard of some sort that do everything automatically. You can do that. And it's a show. But it becomes predictable. So that, the you know, I saw two different performances of the same show by my friend Pascal in Paris. And I could tell that they were different and they were living. And that is the whole point. And Pascal actually once said, uh, the thing about puppetry is that it's a living art that evolves. So the more we can do to keep it living, the better. Eighth, you need to get up to speed by educating yourself on puppetry. You need to know about the history. You need to know what the classics are. You need to, yes, watch videos. You need to read books. And most importantly, you need to find good puppet shows when you travel. So let's say you know you're going to New York City, or you know you're going to Prague, or you know you're going to Paris, or you know you're coming to Tbilisi. You need to say, oh, are there any puppet shows? I, I have people who write to me, Burn, I'm going here. You know, some, who, who did this recently? Uh, someone said uh, they're going to Prague. Oh, and, and they said, do, what do you recommend? I've been looking for puppet theaters. I can't find any. I said, well, I understand why. They're generally not on the tourist diet because they're not in English. But that doesn't mean you can't go there and get a lot out of them because they're visual performances. So I said, well, here, do this, do this, do this. And I gave them five things to do, and they were like, whoa, I didn't realize there was so much stuff there. And I said, well, of course there is. You just need to know what you're doing. But, so, get yourself educated. If you're going to, if you want to start a puppet theater, you need to keep educating yourself. I just read a history of Venetian masks uh, in a book called uh, Venice Incognito. Masks are, to me, related to puppetry, so I'm constantly looking for more things to understand, more that I can bring into it whenever I get around to doing puppetry again. Or if I make a video or whatever. And then there are many practical questions. What to charge? Can you make any money at, uh, at this? Yes, but don't expect to become famous. Uh, what kind of space to work in? Any, you know, what kind of tools do you need? Do you have uh, different kinds of people who like to do different kinds of tasks? And in fact, one of the greatest things about puppetry is it can feed many different other arts and engineering as well. So... You have a friend who likes to make clothes? Guess what? You need someone to make clothes for puppets. Do you have a friend who likes to design strange little uh, mechanical inventions? Guess what? The puppetry always needs kind of engineering feats. Uh, do you have a friend who likes to paint? Guess what? Puppetry can uh, uh, be an excellent source of a way in the in the art, in the way the puppet looks itself, in the backgrounds. Uh, you know, an artist will go crazy. You have a friend who is really good at comedy, bring them to puppetry. Do you have a friend who's really good at drama? Bring them to puppetry. Do you have a friend who's good, at, who likes uh, animation films? Bring them to puppetry. Do you see what I'm saying? So, but these are all other questions, and we're going to leave them aside for now. And uh, let's see. 